Hello everyone, today I've got a special guest. Welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I'm Florian Heiser, and here with me today is economist and troublemaker, shall we say, John Adams. Thanks for dropping past with a Stein. Cheers, mate. Cheers. How are you going? <laughs> good, good. Excellent. So we've we've been uh, driving around what the Gold Coast today and just having a look at what's going on around here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so the last few months I've been with uh, you know the gangster Robbie Barwick. We've been uh, traveling around the country, looking at a few different towns that have uh, some big problems around mortgage stress, uh, negative equity uh, issues with poor construction, etc. And so we're on the the Queensland leg. Uh, so yesterday we went to Toowoomba, had a bit of a look out there. Uh, Toowoomba has the third highest level of mortgage stress in the country, according to Martin North's data set, his independent DFA data set. So that's why we went to Toowoomba yesterday. Um, and then obviously uh, today we wanted to go down to the Gold Coast, Surface Paradise, have a bit of a look down about uh, commercial property, potential uh, issues around construction, etc. And so uh, obviously we, I sent you a message on Facebook Messenger yesterday. Yeah. You, came ba- <laughs> you, you, you came back to me this morning and I said, hey mate, what are you doing? And you go, nothing. Well, hey, well, We'll come and pick you up in 20 minutes and let's go down. Yeah, that's I, I, think, what we did. I haven't even had my coffee yet. And you're saying come to the Gold Coast to yeah. give us a tour. Yes, yeah. Oh, that's the way it happens in YouTube. You know, it's all, all well planned and orchestrated here. It's like a finely tuned machine. Yeah, no, yeah. But, no, but look, no, it was great. The, uh, it, it's always good when you've got a data set um, and the data set says, okay, there's a problem in this area. And then you've got a local who actually understands some of the local dynamics and particular streets to go down and what what to look for. So it's kind of like a military operation. You've got, you've got high level data intelligence and then you've got your <laughs> on the ground so human I'm, intelligence. I'm the grunt on the ground. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 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 so you were able to do our sort of uh, pre, 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 you did our sort of a reconnaissance you knew what to look for etc and then we were going to come in and actually have a look around this is where you were trying to direct us to a few things and obviously one of the interesting things about service paradise was a lot of commercial property um, that that's empty that, that is for lease um, and so that was actually one of the things that Martin so, sort of said he said for Gold Coast it is around stress around commercial property it is around potential um, uh, issues around uh, the quality of buildings um, so obviously not as uh, not as high profile stories on the Gold Coast compared to say um, Sydney with Opal Tower, Mascot Towers, etc. So, yeah, but but obviously yeah. when we were in the car, we had Edwin Almeida on the phone, and he was talking to us about certain developments on the Gold Coast having some problems, um, and that was going to be more of a story going forward. So so that, so that that was obviously interesting. Uh, you know, obviously we haven't seen um, you know. Uh, so obviously, you know, there are massive amounts of apartments, people with lo- large debts, uh, you know, uh, the, the stress isn't as intense on the Gold Coast to say Toowoomba or Mandurah or Perth or some of the other places or even Southwest Sydney like uh, Campbelltown. So Camden. which which is the worst uh, area in, in Queensland? Is Toowoomba the, the one with the highest level of mortgage stress according yeah. to the info you have? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 well, yeah. So third highest in the country, the worst in, um, the worst in Queensland. Um, so yeah, so the way Martin does it is he looks at um, uh, like he looks at the absolute number, how many households in stress. So it's not a, a proportionate measure. It, it's basically saying, well, of the relevant regions or postcoastal towns, you know, how who has the highest number? And so by by number, uh, it's uh, the northwest uh, part of Perth. And then you've got this uh, second is the southwest of Sydney, like the, the Campbelltown, Camden area. And th- number three is Toowoomba. And so this is why Robbie and I went to Toowoomba yesterday to have a bit of a look around. We spent some time in the city. We, we again, we, we had some locals. Uh, one yeah. of the guys we spoke to, he's an engineer. Um, he, he actually was instrumental in building Toowoomba up over the last few decades um, and did a lot of the engineering work. So he gave us some. Uh, because you've got the uh, uh, an eastern mountain range on the eastern part of Toowoomba, a lot of the uh, expansion uh, with the property development is happening in the west. So we went to Glenvale in the western part of Toowoomba yep, yep. To, to have a look at that. And so, yeah, so, you know, all the sort of t- type of issues. But, you know, one of the things that Martin said to us on the phone before, as we're driving in, he goes, you know, you're probably about two years too early to Toowoomba, you know, relatives to say Perth. I mean, Perth's 20% down, Mander is 30% down. I mean, we haven't seen massive price falls in Queensland yet. I mean, you've seen Sydney at 15% yeah, and, yeah. and Melbourne, Melbourne at 11 I mean, we're, we're always going to look at affordable to all the people that are escaping Sydney and Melbourne. They'll come up here and they say, oh, wow, you know, look, at the, look what I can get for my value for money here yeah. compared to there. But, I mean, uh, yesterday I was at a function and there was an older architect talking to a younger guy saying, oh, you need to get in the property sector. Now interest rates are so low, you need to buy, buy, buy. 
and I was saying you need to wait calm down and don't settle you know see where the market's gonna go uh, so how I mean how is it possible that we're getting people at suffering mortgage stress right now when rates are what, 1% insanely low uh, have, are they just trapped in because they you know they probably had a lot fixed in interest rates and they're, they're suffering for it, it was just the cost of living and everything was just chat chipping away at them sure sure so there's a probably a couple of points there so when i've been openly writing for news.com and doing these shows with martin north and others and so and saying economic armageddon is coming so what is economic armageddon is it's based on a very simple statistical fact which is we have the biggest debt bubble in australian history at the same time we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world um and there is no empirical case study that any professional economist can point to to show that when you've got a debt bubble of this magnitude that it's not going to result res in a catastrophic in a catastrophic um, sort of situation a crisis economic event so now uh, you know some people said Armageddon is a specific type of event this is where your Harry Dent says it's going to be um, uh, in terms of massive deflation um, you know Martin North to a certain degree has talked about a collapse in the property market you've had other people say no it's going to be hyperinflation this is your, 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 you know uh, Peter Schiff uh, from America Lynette Zhang from ITM trading in America because of all of the world uh, central bank money printing etc so I wrote a piece of, you know the six pathways to economic arm again for news.com last year and I wrapped mapped, mapped out six scenarios three deflation three inflation and basically saying that you know you got a big debt bubble and one of the things it, we're either going to go in one or two directions either the debt bubble collapses and it's going to be some sort of deflationary event where you see a massive collapse in asset prices uh, mainly in property because that's where the debt bubble is and in, 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 in our circumstances it's, it's a household debt bubble push into property or if, if the central bank our RBA and the other central banks print massive amounts of new stimulus and this is where the unconditional policy comes in from from um, in terms of uh, you know quantitative easing negative interest rates helicopter money all of that sort of jargon if that starts to happen you're going to see the Australian dollar tank um, and, and so that's going to lead to an inflation rebound this is where when I um, spoke uh, debated Christopher Joy on the all money uh, channel back in March I said housing crisis dollar crisis so it's either the, the dollar goes or the property market goes and, and, and that's really um, both very extreme events very um, uh, you know brings a lot of hardship to a lot of middle-class families uh, and that's obviously the big concern I have um, and, and, and hence this is why I've been out there trying to warn the public about what the what the real state of the economy is and so you asked before about how is it we've got record low interest rates and everyone is suffering uh, uh, you know in terms of uh, mortgage stress basically what happens is when you have a bubble um, uh, you know uh, real real economic resources get concentrated in that bubble so for example if you've got a bubble in cryptos everyone's yep, rushing yep, to cryptos yep. late 90s everyone uh, big bubble in internet stocks everyone's rushing to internet well obviously when you've got a bubble in in, in sort of uh, consumption retail but also in terms of property you get a you get a, a so whole whole bunch of people getting in their firms employees everyone's earning super profit super wages everyone has been conditioned to think that their uh, their wages and their and their profits are normal they then lock in uh, debt commitments at those normal levels and then when the once the bubble starts to come apart and people's either they become unemployed or their incomes reduced even including with business profits that's when the debt serviceability becomes a problem because they locked in debt commitments um, when they thought everything was fantastic, yep. thinking it was sustainable and it's not, and then when it doesn't, that's when you get this systemic crisis because you're getting you know, a critical mass of people, 20, 30, 40 percent of the population struggling to pay these debts, and that's what happened in that's what happened in Ireland in 10 years ago, yep. and yep. we're pretty much on the precipice of that because the banks basically gave out these mortgages. Uh, people thought it was all sustainable. Now, massive, massive systemic mortgage fraud because the banks themselves use artificial um, benchmarks to. They didn't do full proper. Yeah, that, that's, that's, for that's still that still seems like professional negligence. It just if, if if any other professional was just cutting corners like that, yeah, you'd be done. You'd sure. be done. But the banks are getting away with it because they're they're you know they're a police under themselves. Or we had the whole royal commission, and now that seems to have faded away because every, banks everyone's friend again because the government wants stimulus, 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 or more people borrowing, borrowing, borrowing to kind of prop up this bubble. That's right. That's uh, right. One thing that really got to me was when I was reading uh, Matt Barry uh, did a, an article yeah. a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. just how much of Australia's GDP was located in a corridor near Sydney, like 24% of our GDP for what 2016, mm -hmm. in apartments. And now we're seeing the apartments are all falling down. They're all having issues. Yeah. People are, uh, you know, the average, you know, mum and dad are going to get hurt. Yeah. But one thing I'm thinking, because, you know, we're, we're here talking, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people, uh, we're preaching to the choir in many ways, particularly on my channel. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's getting out and exposing other people to the to these type of ideas. Are you finding that that people just don't want to listen or don't want to hear it or want to you know say oh it'll all be fine? You know I don't use ten thousand dollars cash anyway, so I don't need to worry about that. Are you finding it? You're starting to break down some of those barriers and get um, more more normies, I say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so 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 probably what I would say is that there that, that there are three camps. Uh, so when I started doing these shows with Martin North, uh, we started doing Walk the World about uh, thirteen months ago, uh, and then at the beginning of this year, two thousand nineteen, we started with our own new channel in the interest of the people. So so I would say there's three camps. There's a camp of people who always knew that there was a problem, and and there was no vehicle or voice where they could go to get information and have a discussion about that and so this is where we're important you're important I mean there's other people around the country got their own sort of angle on this and and, and there's this you know, there's a now a number of uh, YouTube channels talking about this openly and people who know there's a problem they're flocking to that because they because they want to hear this point of view yep so that's group one group two is open-minded people who have come to listen to Martin and I and obviously some of our shows we're getting you know 40 50 60,000 views and so people who are open-minded uh, and saying okay these guys know something I want to learn from them I didn't realize there's a problem but now I, I've come to realize there's a problem and, and and so that's group two and group three is either they don't know and they don't want to listen um, or, 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 or they refuse to accept that there is a problem. Now, uh, now and, and that could be 90% of the population. That could be 99.5, huge, huge percentage of pro, uh, huge percentage of the population. Now, my, my contention has always been is to, to have the biggest debt bubble in the history of the country, uh, everyone who signed on to these massive amounts of debt they have to believe that there's no problem, there's no systemic risk, um, and, and, and therefore, because if there's no risk, there's no problem in signing out these big debts. So to have the biggest debt bubble in the history of the country, you need a psycholo psychological predisposition that either um, there's no, you know, nothing's wrong, or or that, um, or, or that, you know, look, at, nothing will happen to us. And this is where, um, you know, I did a show with Martin earlier this year and said Australia does not have superpowers because I hear this all the time. You know, we're different, we're unique. It happens overseas. <laughs> um, you know, it's not going to happen to us, or the government won't allow it to happen to us. And and this is one of the myths I'm trying to break is that, down. Is that what people are telling you? Yeah, the government yeah, won't let this happen. Yeah, to us? no, I've had numerous people. Oh. contact me from across Australia and they go I've talked to my friends my work colleagues family and one of the excuses that people try to justify why this is this collapse is not going to happen is because um, the government won't let it happen now having been a former economic advisor in, in the federal parliament I know these politicians uh, you know the economic literacy within parliament is extremely low they don't understand half, half of the stuff that Martin and I talk about and this is why members of parliament watch our show on a regular basis because we're educating members of parliament because we, we go do the research and we present our point of view on a whole host of issues whether it's about property banking economics uh, you know the cash transaction ban bill that uh, is before parliament now um, and, and, and and so yeah, so um, you know, when people think, oh, okay, well, they're not going to let it happen. I mean, the reality is, is that most of these people have absolutely no idea what they're doing and what they're talking about. And I would include not only the parliamentarians, but some of the bureaucrats. I mean, a lot of these people in the RBA, APRA, Treasury, Keynesian people. I mean, John Lehman Keynes in 1927 said, we will not have a financial crisis in our lifetime. Two years later, the New York Stock Exchange absolutely collapsed. Now. Last year, look, what 2017, Janet Yellen, former chair, chairwoman of the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve, the financial crisis will not happen now in our lifetime. It's, a, it's history repeating again. John Maynard Keynes, Janet Yellen, and yet in both cases they said it at a big, at a big debt bubble, and the debt bubble's about, maybe, maybe about that's to blow a, Maybe that's a good indicator that we're about to hit. You know, it's a good predictor. <laughs> Potentially so. Yeah. So, so, so you've got these idiot elite economists who everything, who everyone thinks that they know what they're talking about, making these wild statements that we'll never have a financial crisis in our lifetime, and we're on the precipice of the biggest crisis in the history of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah, 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 no, because no, no, I mean, you just got stunned there. But when you think about it, if we've got the biggest step up in the history of the country and the biggest step up in the history of the world, so I mean, the global debt statistic it comes from the International Institute for Finance, which is a Washington based think tank, and they track uh, in terms of what global debt is. So they came out with a number for the first quarter of 2019 uh, uh, last month, and they said it's at 246.5 trillion. Uh, you know, so at, at, a, at, a, at a nominal level, uh, that's the, 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 the highest in the world, almost 320% of global GDP. The, the, in the history of the world, we have never had that, uh, that, that, that sort of happen. And obviously, you know, we have a debt, but everyone's got a debt, everyone's drowning in debt. You know, we're drowning in debt, everyone's drowning in debt. Now, 15% of global debt 
is, is China. And so obviously one of the risks for Australia is, you know, we could go by ourselves and we could have a, a massive uh, economic crisis independent of the rest of the world. But if China goes, I mean, we, 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 are, we are stuffed. Um, and, and the reality is we've got millions of Australians who are after the eyeballs in debt thinking things are okay you know I mean, martin's data says there's a million households and uh, households that are in more distress so the, there's a million households struggling to pay debts at the moment but if there is is a systemic global or domestic shock to the economy uh, and you see a massive spike in, in unemployment for example um, a lot of these families uh, whether it's in Mandra or Toowoomba or Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or the Gold Coast they are going to be absolutely smashed and the reality that comes out of that is and an economic and social horror that this that our generation has not seen and and, mm. and so and, and and that's what Armageddon is um, and so so again you know um, some people think I'm crazy some people think I'm smart but you, know, you look at the underlying data, you look at economic history, you put two and two together. And, and again, you know, a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, I was, in, uh, I was in Sydney with Robbie. We met a federal senator um, uh, who, who's a cluey guy. And I said, show me, I'll shut my mouth if you show me a, an empirical case study where something like this ain't gonna blow up. And the reality is that case study doesn't exist. And again, you know, whether it's Christopher Joy or Switzer or, or uh, you know, the RBA, etc. I make the challenge to anyone. Show me a time where a debt bubble of this magnitude will not blow up and result in a catastrophic economic outcome, one, you know, whether it's inflation or deflation, and I'll shut my mouth and they can't. And, and that's why I continue to do what I do and, and, and challenge the establishment uh, publicly yep. the way I'm doing it. Well, there, there'd be two, two questions I'd have for you for that. Sure. Uh, Okay, first say, you know, we get a debt bubble, we get a you know, depression or a, a catastrophic economic event happening here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One, how can we make sure future generations can't follow in the next footstep? My, my argument would be to try and get a bit more of an understanding of, of economics at an ed educational level and, and monetary mm -hmm. theory yeah, mon yeah. up at the you know, school level all the way up. Yeah, yeah. And the second is how could we, you know, it, it's hey, okay, Prime Minister Scomo rings you up going, John, you're in charge. You get six months to deflate the bubble. What would you do? Okay, so 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 let me take the second question first. So, um, I I've long argued that we are better off deflating our bubble before the global debt bubble blows up because it, you know, people in the government have told me to my face, they go, we know what we're doing. We are inflating the bubble, we're kicking the can down the road. Now that's just going to exacerbate the problems if a glo if the global debt bubble uh, uh, collapses. Um, and we, as a middle class, are not ready for that. The economic and social cost is far higher than, than, than yeah. otherwise be the case. And my argument would be is, is that because we have the biggest dom domestic debt bubble in history, we are the least prepared in more than 200 years to, to, to face a global crisis. So, so what I would do is I would push, I would take the economy into a deep recession. I would try to liquidate household debt. I, I would try to um, you know, increase household savings, reduce debt, um, and try to restructure this economy because you have to restructure because we've got a massive we've got too many firms and in, in, in employees employed in construction in retail in real estate um, and, and some of these other sort of bubble sectors and you need to start getting real industry back like manufacturing so you need a massive restructuring of the economy um, and that's a very painful exercise and I've said to politicians if you think you can just click your fingers and, and hope that the debt just wishes away I mean, I mean that's fantasy thinking so there, there will be pain it will be severe pain now there's ways that you can shorten that pain um, uh, like in terms of the time frame but I would be moving towards a recession pushing the economy into a recession now into a deep recession to restructure the economy so that if China does blow up you know households have a, have a much more equipped with it in their balance sheets to absorb that shock relative to the situation that we have now. So that's what I would do largely if I was prime minister today. And, and, and I've had certain politicians saying, well, um, if we if we um, induced a, a preemptive recession, that's bad politics and we can't win elections like that. And, and, and the reality is they setting up uh, they setting up the, the middle class for 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 un, untold horror. Number one and number two, I've said, I've said to these guys in the Liberal Party, I said, um, if, if this if this event that I'm saying is going to happen happens before the next election, and the way the bond markets in the US are, 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 are looking, it looks like it will happen before the next federal election. Um, I said a generation of Austra a generation of Australians will not forgive the Liberal Party and will not trust you again. And just look at say 
the uh, the political party in Ireland that was in government during the housing crisis, 12 years, in, 12 years on, haven't gone back into government. The Republican Party were in charge during the st uh, collapse of the New York, New York Stock Exchange. Took them nearly two, 20 to 25 years to regain political power in America. So, so yeah, and, you know, when you get a massive catastrophic economic event, the Liberal Party could be looking at two decades out of power, or it could be the end of the Liberal Party. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm depending yeah, on yeah, depending yeah. On, on on how <coughs> in, in terms of how people. Well, if, if you just look at the the voting now, how many people are going to minors? Uh, you know, at the last election, just with their first preferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yes. So, so one of the ways I like to look on that because that's been something I've been tracking. One of the ways I like to look at that is, you know, what is the non-Labor, non-Coalition, non-Green vote in the Senate? Now, um, uh, 2016, it got to about 26 percent. Uh, at the last recent 2019 election, it, it came back a little bit, about 24 percent. But you're looking at about at the moment quarter of the population saying the big three, no, thank you, and they're looking for something else. Well, that could dramatically escalate, um, and voting preferences. Could change so, so so yeah massive political risk for the establishment if if it happens on their watch and this is where i've said i was in a in in, a, in the office of a federal mp last december in federal parliament and they said we know we've screwed it up and, a, and the strategy of the establishment is plausible deniability and why because they don't oh, they, come on no, 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 i'm kidding no, no, this was a legit one-on-one -on -one conversation with a federal parliamentarian and so this is why this is why the blowing up the bubble this is why they're kicking the can down the road because they're hoping that a deutsche bank a china something um, else can be blamed exactly and they say well for, if deutsche bank went bankrupt tonight and, we, and you had a collapse of the world market what's the prime minister going to say well i don't control that bank uh, I don't manage that bank. That was beyond the control. Of, <laughs> that, that was the control of my government. Yep. You can't blame me for Deutsche Bank. You can't blame me for China. You can't blame me for blah 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 blah. Therefore, economy's gone well. Unemployment is under control. Inflation's under control. Um, you know, we've got robot. We've got genuine. We've got good growth. I mean, look. I mean, this is the script. This is the script, and this is why they're hoping for Deutsche to go off one of these things to yeah. go. So, so because 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 th there's a lot of money on the line, and there's a lot of reputations and a lot of careers on the line, and so whether it's at APRA, RBA, government, uh, ASIC, etc., there's a lot of people trying to protect their domestic position uh, by hoping something overseas blows up, and, and this is where the buddies in the mainstream media are just going to shift the blame over to that international event, and say, well, yep. you know, yep. nothing to see here. So that's point number one. Point number two is about coming back. Well, how do we prevent this ha happening in, in the past uh, in the future so absolutely economic and business literacy in this country is extremely low that has to be improved but the other thing that has to uh, be be addressed in my view is you know obviously the way people are being conditioned to say is that what happened in the past you know, was in the past and therefore it can't happen in the future now okay so so his excuse we had the gfc you know the americans had in some county so like in riverside county which is about 90 minutes east of uh, lax that fell 60 percent so you you had some big collapses in say california florida arizona texas all of that sort of stuff but then obviously you've got ireland except now uh greece uh cyprus etc Part of the excuse is to say, well, that's over there. This is Australia. We're different. So that's one excuse. Or if you start talking about the Great Depression, um, or, or the 1892 Depression, or even the 1991 recession, oh, well, that was back then. Uh, you know, today well, we're, we're much smarter and better now. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the economy was is fundamentally different today than it was, say, in the 1880s or the 1920s or the 1980s. Therefore, there there is no comparison. Whereas, you know, from an economic, macroeconomic point of view, debt is debt, and you've got to. And once you get debt at, at elevated levels, whether it's against GDP or household income or whatever metric you want to pick, you know, you have a problem. So, 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 yeah. So, what I think one one has to teach the population that just because some historical event happened a hundred years ago um you know you know i mean just because it happened a hundred years ago i mean that does not mean that it can't happen again you've got to look at the underlying factors well why did that what were the why did that happen what was the circumstances around it what were the forward in the indicators what was the underlying structural problem in that economic crisis whether it's the 1892 or the great depression 1991 and and does the current phenomena represent any of those crises and the reality is is that what we have today is, is a copybook uh, 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 copycat example of the 1880s 
um, because massive household debt bubble, massive land price bubble in the 1880s, and it collapsed um, um, in 1892. And that's and that's the and, and this is the other thing that people don't understand. 1892 was the was a bigger depression in Australia compared to the great to, to the Great Depression. So in the, in the United States, well, that affected Australia more than the Great Depression. E exactly, and the reason why is is that um, uh, what well, two reasons was. Uh, uh, our banks in Australia went bust, um, whereas in the Great Depression our banks didn't go bust because in the Great Depression we had uh, um, in the eighteen in the nineteen twenties the debt bubble in Australia was in state government uh, balance sheets, um, whereas in the eighteen eighties it was household debt. Mm -hmm. And so when we had a crisis in the in the Great Depression, it was it was like the Greeks in two thousand twelve sovereign debt crisis that led to a foreign debt problem because the state government borrowed directly from the London banks, and now yep. domestic banks were okay. Whereas in the eighteen eighties and the eighteen nineties, our domestic banks got in trouble because the the people who borrowed from those domestic banks, all those who speculated on land, couldn't pay, and, and that's where that's where our domestic banks went bust. And, and so when the banks go bust. Uh, that's obviously what you have a bigger, deeper depression compared to if, if the domestic banking system survives. And, and, and that's obviously some of the big differences between them. And so, you know, if you're looking at, you know, in, in the course of Australian history, which is the closest uh, economic crisis to look at, it is 1892. And, and yet, look, I mean, there's not a lot of documentation I, I, out there. I didn't even know that we had a depression in 1892 until I started looking at all of these things on YouTube and because and, Never discussed in school. Never discussed in oh, history. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Look, I mean, look at the way history is being taught. I mean, I was always been a big history buff, and you know, like a great, good economist. Uh, you know, they're not just economists; they're actually very good historians. And so, yeah, uh, massive depression, eighteen ninety two. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, GDP fell seventeen percent in two years. It took seven. It took seven. It, it took from eighteen ninety two back to eighteen ninety nine for the economy to recover back to the pre to the pre bubble. It was nearly took a decade in terms of recovery and, and even on this issue of say you know bailing which has happened in cyprus and we talked about this this morning in the car yeah, yeah. of where you know they confiscated deposits and gave uh, shares in the bank what happened in bank in cyprus in 2012 yep. 13 that actually happened in 1892 1893 now they didn't call it bailing. So we yeah. invented it australia invented it well uh, well, I mean, so, so so what happened in Cyprus in 2012, 2013 definitely happened in 1892, 1893 in Australia. Whether there was a previous episode before that, I'm not entirely sure. But um, it wasn't called bailing; it was called reconstruction. Um, and so there was a show. There was a show that um, now, the, the reason why it was called reconstruction was because basically what they tried to do was okay, this bank's insolvent. Let's create a new bank and let's actually transfer um, the bank customers and the shareholders into a new bank, and the depositors were given shares in the new bank um, for, uh, uh, for their deposits. And, and, and that's how Bailin happened, uh, in that, and, and that's, and that's yeah. what they called a reconstruction because they were reconstructing a new bank. Now. One of the key differences is, and, and so if people are interested to look at this in more detail, Martin North and I did a show um, uh, on our uh, channel in the interest of people. And, and back in, I think, April or March, we said it's too late, bailing has already happened. And we go to chapter yep, verse yep. and we go to a specific bank in 1892 in Melbourne. We talk about the bank, we talk about what the deal for the for the uh, depositors were, we talk about the, the specific bank directors, we name names, it's all documented in historical books. And so, yeah, so even on this question of, of bailing, can it happen in Australia? People go, well, no, 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 it can never happen in this country, what happened in Cyprus? Well, it already happened. And, and, and so again, you know, people are very clueless about what the level of risk is with their own financial circumstances and about the state of the macroeconomic uh, uh, economy and the level of systemic risk. And, and what we're trying to do is try to, to try and to bring, you know, facts and, and, and reason to this uh, problem, because I think this is the biggest problem that we the country faces, which is we're drowning in debt. So uh, probably one last question for you. Sure. Now, so we've had a historical precedent happen. And you, you can have a rest while I ramble. Sure. We had a historical piece that we've happened, and we've, we've, we've seen that you know the, the reconstruction methodology was applied. How, as probably a heartless bastard, who made the big money back there? <laughs> How can you leverage yourself to take advantage for it? Was anyone you know in, well positioned, or was it just the government or the bankers? Or well, no. Well, look. So, 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 is that's a really interesting question. So, in extreme economic events, um, you know, a lot of people lose out. And you have a massive economic and social catastrophe. But the smart cookies, if they play it well, they can set themselves up for 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 a, a century. Now, 
one one of the big families. So if you remember back uh, maybe five, six, seven years ago, who was the Premier of t t uh, Victoria? You, oh, okay. I'm, I, like, yeah, yeah, okay. The last premier I remember was Kenneth. <laughs> okay, been, I haven't lived in Victoria for a long time. Okay, so so, so yeah, so um, you know, so so Labor, um, Daniel Andrews is now in power. Yep. Now, be, I mean, be, before that, you had um, you know, you had the, the the Liberals in. Now, the Liberals for for a while were not in power. They had Ted Bayou. Mm -hmm. He was the premier, and then after a while, he quit because his poll numbers were down, and they had a you know, they had a new premier that that sort of failed to win re-election. Now. The Bailey family made an absolute mozza in 1892 in that depression. And, and so the Bailey family has been one of the wealthiest families in Victoria for more than a century. And why? Because the 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 the, the, the Bailey family in the 1892, um, they actually did a lot of land speculation. They played it smart. They, they got out of the market at the right time and they had all this wealth and they set up all of their heirs to basically, you know, um, be privately educated, run for public office. And so Ted Bailey in 2009-10 rose to Premier because his, his, his forebears played the depression well. And, and so, 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 so this is where, you know, if you play it well, you can live a fantastic lifestyle for the rest of your life. But if you've got kids and grandkids, well, you can set up two, three yeah, generations. <laughs> no, seriously. Now, I mean, the other example is, is, is the Kennedys. Now, uh, um, uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, JFK's father, so a famous story. He had a massive amount of shares in the, in the New York Stock Exchange, and, and you know he had a shoe shine boy tell him on the verge of the collapse, "Oh, why don't you buy? It? You should be in the market buying shares." And he said to himself, "Well, if the shoe shine boy is saying we need to buy shares, you know, it, it, it must be a bubble." <laughs> so, so, so the famous story is it yep. goes that once the shoe shine boy told him to buy shares, he sold out, yep. and he took all of his money, and, and basically he set up his uh, he set up his family's wealth. And then when JFK wanted to run for Congress uh, uh, after World War II, then then Senate, then for president, um, Joseph Kennedy's wealth was the basis for uh, the Kennedy yep. uh, thing. So yeah, so again, the Ke whether the Baileys or the Kennedys, you play at an economic crisis well, and you can set up your kids and your grandkids and even your great grandkids for 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 big things whether it's in, in commerce or the military or in government and, and there are examples of that and so yeah again you know depending on how people are you know we're late i think we're late in the game now some people who have those sort of big long-term ambitions um if they if they've been if they're smart they're educated if they're ready to play the game well um you know they can set themselves up and they uh, and the and the generations to come to to lead this country uh, for those who are not well prepared. I still think there's, you know, some time for them to try to uh, make some moves to improve their balance sheet and build some buffers. But again, I think we're headed towards the biggest crisis in 200 years uh, because it's the biggest debt bubble, both domestically and globally. Um, and, and 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 that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate people, and we're and, and we're trying to tell people that the level of systemic risk is far higher than we, we what you've been led to believe by the government and the mainstream yep. media. Um, and hopefully we can help more people before it's too late. So I think that it's a good positive note to end on. You know, while we may be facing economic Armageddon, everyone, there is an opportunity there to set your, your forebears up for the foreseeable future, or at least to soften the blow. And I, I think what you and Martin are doing, particularly with, with all your, you know, the YouTube and the outreach, and exposing a lot of people to to really these type of issues that a lot of people wouldn't even have thought about, I think it's fantastic. And it's really good to see it's happening and, it's, and how much it's growing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm enjoying it. And, and thank you very much for coming past for a start. I appreciate it, John. No worries, man. Yeah, and uh, Anytime. keep in touch. And next time thank you're you. up here, hey, maybe give me a little bit more notice next time. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. So, guys, thank you all very much. Thanks, and mate. I'll see you next time. See ya.